please grab a seat and we'll get started. And uh, I'm going to mangle your name. Arjun. Arjun is going to give a presentation on the DGI on board SDK. You can speak to here or if you want to use this. Hey guys, uh, my name is Arjun. I've uh, worked with Camp before at Euro Robotics. I recently joined, uh, on recent, sometime back, joined uh, <laughs> DJI Research. Uh, um, so I mainly work with the onboard SDK team. Um, so uh, all of the um, applications that run on top of the aircraft, uh, you can basically look up on the computer. Um, all of the applications that uh, work uh, are based on the onboard SDK. Um, so uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the onboard SDK itself. So what is the onboard SDK? It basically runs on the computer uh, on top of the aircraft. So for example, this right here is a uh, TK1 actually, but it's called a DJI Manifold. You can actually get this at the, on the DJI website. Um, it actually talks to the aircraft using a UART port. Uh, you could also use uh, another computer of your choice. You could use an x86 platform based or any other ARM processor, Raspberry Pi, or anything. Um, so uh, what is the onboard SDK? It's basically a code library that communicates with the flight controller. And then uh, we write applications on top of that. We have a lot of sample applications. We have uh, applications that have uh, that run on pure Linux. Uh, we have ROS, uh, of course. And we have an STM32-based uh, application. I'll get to what those applications are in a second. Um, so those are like our supported applications. And uh, all of this code, all of the, the code library and everything, it's all completely open source. Um, even the applications that we have right now are open source. And uh, our idea is to get uh, some more of the open source community, the researchers, uh, into the DJI platform. Uh, on, in the drone side, uh, especially with the research community, you don't see as much of uh, you know DJI products. It's uh, a lot of 3DR and all that stuff. So we're trying to uh, improve our presence there. Um, yeah, even the protocol, the underlying protocol with the flight controller is also uh, completely open. Um, so, um, yeah, we're also trying to focus on enterprise customers. So, uh, we are thinking about building applications on top of this whole library that could, uh, you know, be useful for other enterprise customers. Um, the two main platforms that we support is this guy, which is the Matrice 100. Um, it has a 1 kg payload. Uh, we also have a bigger aircraft, it's a hexacopter, it takes six kilograms. It's uh, on our newer generation flight controller, it's called the A3 flight controller. So um, you can actually hook up a computer and uh, control these two aircrafts. Um, this is uh, kind of a basic architecture of uh, what uh, it looks like. It, on the left side is the flight controller, um, right next to it is the core library. And uh, on top of that, on the right side is the applications. There are several applications that we have right now, and I'll get to those details in the next slide. So these are some of the features of the uh, onboard SDK itself. Uh, so you can have real-time attitude control of the aircraft. You can have velocity control. You can have position control. You can also you know, run different waypoint missions. Um, uh, the other advantage is that you can have your own custom sensors on it. You can have a LiDAR on top of it. You can have your own uh, camera on top of it. Uh, we have an application that makes use of the, uh, the Velodyne puck, uh, which is actually on our website. Uh, you can download the code and hook it up to this Matrice 100 and you know, uh, start mapping. So um, we really made this platform so that you can put uh, different kinds of sensors on it, and it doesn't matter whether it's DJI or not. Um, we also have an ADSB uh, receiver, uh, an example with an ADSB receiver. An ADSB receiver now has gotten like this big. Uh, it's really small now. So you can get like a 100 mile range of all the aircrafts, the manned aircrafts near you. So if you want to do something like stay away from them for a mile, or uh, you know just uh, just general um, idea of where they are, it, it really does that for you. Um, so we have that code also as a sample application that you can. Download. Um, so, in order to, yeah, so one of the questions, uh, you know, with a ground robot, the advantage is that you can just run it, uh, you can run the code on top of it, and you can start going. But with a drone, when you have your code that's running there, how do you actually start up the aircraft safely from a distance and just start running your code? So, uh, we make use of, uh, there's a different team within our company, it's, uh, it's the mobile SDK team. We have, an, again, an open application that you can download. 
and then you can uh, basically run all your onboard applications by the press of a button. So all of the existing applications right now on board uh, the aircraft can be run on an app that you can sideload onto your phone. Um, so we support uh, iOS right now, but um, we're planning for Android in the future. Um, we also have a simulator, so all of the uh, flight controllers come with a built-in simulator, so they actually have the exact physics of the aircraft itself. Um, so for the newer, uh, uh, the other flight controller that we have, the A3 flight controller, uh, you can also change the moment of inertia, the mass of the vehicle, and you can uh, see how the aircraft behaves differently. Um, it's, it's not uh, as good as gazebo or anything, it doesn't have the ability to interface with the outside world, uh, but it just gives you a general idea of how the aircraft actually behaves. Um, yeah, this is a little bit about the mobile SDK. So uh, the mobile SDK is also uh, a completely different uh, DJI-based SDK that you can write. Uh, we support iOS and Android. Uh, you usually excuse me, you usually write uh, applications in the mobile SDK where latency is not really an issue. Um, so for you know just starting up a command, uh, that kind of stuff, you can use the mobile SDK. It's actually got a very rich API uh, and. Um, uh, you know, for something like close to control or something like heavy applications where you're doing some image processing, you'd rather do it on board. Um, so we have a communication link between the mobile and the onboard SDK, and that's what allows us to get the full three mile range. So you can have your application or your aircraft sitting about a mile away, and with your application in your hand, you could just press a button and you know get the aircraft to go and take a couple of photographs and come back and land around with you. So. Um, these two actually work in tandem. So recently we had the uh, developer challenge, which was a showcase of the onboard SDK and the mobile SDK working together. Uh, it was in association with Ford and United Nations. Uh, the uh, kind of the high level uh, idea was to be able to rescue uh, you know, uh, uh, survivors in a earthquake situation of fire. So uh, the whole, uh, the challenge itself was simulated uh, with April tags, so we had different April tags at uh, kind of under a house, uh, under a bridge, uh, under a rock, and in some difficult places to get. And um, the, uh, the drone had to autonomously take off from a moving truck at 20 miles an hour, go to the search and rescue area, find as many April tags as it can. Um, the, this particular aircraft also has a guidance system that you can see right in front, so it has like a sonar and an optical uh, flow camera. Um, so what you, kind of tags? Uh, Able tags. About AR tags. Those that just like AR tags, it's based off of the AR tags, but it's Able tags. Yeah. What so it gives you pose information and X, Y, and Z. Uh, so, um, so yeah, you basically have to go and find as many tags as you can, and then come back uh, autonomously and land on a moving truck. So uh, this whole thing has to be done with just one press of a button. Uh, the pilot is sitting inside this moving truck. I was actually one of the car judges uh, sitting inside the uh, truck. This happened at uh, Syracuse in New York. Um, that was the one place that was FAA. You know, they, they allowed us to uh, fly our aircraft. We were flying right next to some really big aircraft that came in for service but um, the years ago, so that's why we had it. And um, uh, we, uh, there were several teams, actually, uh, that applied for it. There were about 120 teams that applied at the beginning of this year. Uh, they we reduced it down to 25 teams uh, after there were a bunch of, uh, we basically told them to submit a report of how they would go about it, reduce that down to 25 teams, and the, from 25 we reduced it down to 10 teams after they showed us a video of static landing on top of an April tag, um, as well as how they would go about trying to land on the uh, moving truck. So yeah, there were 10 teams, they were from uh, Korea, Austria, uh, China, of course the US, Canada, um, several several countries, um, and the winner gets uh, $100,000, uh, and only first place, so it's a pretty hard one. Um, so I have a video of the winning team uh, that did the anonymous landing on top of the truck. Um, the, uh, the same team did the search and rescue part also, but it was kind of hard to get that video. Uh, it was only one team that managed to do it successfully on a moving truck. Uh, there were about two other teams that did it on a static truck couple of other teams that managed to get the search and rescue tags. Nobody got all of the tags. Uh, I think the max they got was three out of six tags, so it was a pretty fun. Now is the drone finding the tag or actually 
That's fine enough. No, it's just looking at the camera. It's okay. detecting it. It's taking a photograph okay. of it. Fine, fine, yeah. Phase two. Is it a report back with the GPS coordinates of the tag that it found? That kind of yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So um, I don't know if the audio is hooked up, but oh yeah, it's HD monitor, so it works. So <laughs> So the left side is the view of the truck, the right side is upside down. This is all runs. large tag to see from a distance. It has about five other smaller tags. Um, so you can kind of choose which one it wants, also give it some leeway in terms of space. I was, I was hoping for a little more information. Yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, so, so I mean, I don't know if you guys have heard of the Park 107. Uh, it's yes. called Park 107. Uh, it's basically the new laws that have come in for to operate um, a drone commercially. Uh, so uh, you actually have to go through a full flight test. Uh, the the uh, exam itself is very close to a private pilot license. About 70 to 80 percent of it is understanding the airspace. Um, making sure that you radio in the closest uh, ADC and then know that you're actually flying. So they want to do this kind of stuff to uh, kind of bring some safety aspect to it and we suspect that eventually this might move to, you know, probably line of sight within a certain range uh, uh, or no line of sight within a certain mm. range. Yeah. Mm. <coughs> so, we'll see. Yeah. So there's a question about using the SDK. So it sounds like um, you would have a computer like your TK1 or something, mounted on that uh, drone, and then that's where all of your computing happens. There's no link to like a ground station or? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So it's, it basically sits on top of the drone, just like this, it gets screwed in. And the, uh, most of the communication happens between just the aircraft and the computer. Yeah. But in terms of the ground station, you could get it to get telemetry data to, through the mobile SDK, uh, which I mentioned sort of back. Um, the mobile SDK is the communication with your RC, uh, wherever you're standing. So you could uh, get you know, any kind of telemetry data if you want to the ground station. You could give it commands uh, to land, to take off. So, to go so the telemetry would come back <coughs> Through a phone, that's the only way to get it, or it comes back through the radio control. Through your radio control? Yeah, it, it okay. uses the light bridge uh, radio control and then comes to your phone. Okay, so another question if I can dig in, dig in a little more. Um, so the IMU in there uh, has a, a GPS and I, I presume other, yeah. the other normal IMU components. Mm -hmm. So, how good is the localization? I mean, if I come back, command it to a particular spot, um, What's uh, what's the yeah. error, error sphere right around that? Um, so uh, we actually have a pretty decent IMU on there. Uh, with GPS, we get about 1.5 to 2 meters. Uh, it drops down to about 0.5 meters to 1 meter. 
Okay, so that's right. the diameter of an error sphere or the radius of an error? Yeah, the radius of right. If you command it, that's kind of the error. That is it. One to two meters. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So DGI is primarily commercial, consumer, both, yeah. all the above? That's a good question. I mean, I don't know if you guys saw the recent folding drone that was launched by GoPro and recently by DJI. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's these guys, I mean, DJI is big into consumer drones. Um, these two aircrafts are one of our first kind of developer research slash uh, enterprise drones um, trying to get into the space now. Yeah. So what kind of functionality is in the SDK? Um, yeah, so uh, you can actually command the aircraft uh, using attitude control, so you can get roll pitch yaw uh, in whatever angle that you want, up to 35 degrees. Uh, you could get position back to the, your computer, so you could do any kind of trajectories, uh, movement control, that kind of stuff. You do have a video that's coming into the uh, computer as well, uh, so you could do any kind of computer vision. Based on that, you could command it to go to a specific location for example. Um, it also has uh, waypoint missions, so you could tell it to go to um, you know, five different GPS locations, and uh, it would go there and then come back to the home and land. Uh, you could also have a point of interest mission. Uh, you could just give it a specific radius and um, give it a specific GPS location, and it would circle that particular point of interest with the camera facing towards um, that point of interest. Uh, you also have a follow me um, uh, feature, which is uh, which you which you know, allows you to just follow it just using the GP, uh, GPS of the RC. So that's some of the features. What kind of uh, data rate for the video? Uh, so for the video, we get about fifty hertz right now. Presumably, that only goes to the onboard or the. Uh, computer mounted to the uh, drone, there's nothing uh, externally sent over the radio. There is actually. Uh, you can actually get it to send it through the RC. You can get 720p video on your phone okay. while it's uh, flying. Really? What kind of frequency and radio does this? This is actually, uh, it's actually built by DJI. Um, it's called Lightbridge 2. And it's got really good range. Uh, it's got three miles in this case and the uh, recent folding drone is 4.3 miles range, uh, which is pretty crazy. Uh, but it's a 2.4 gigs and a 5 gig frequency. Yeah. Any other questions? Bryce? Yeah. <laughs> oh, is this kind of like a, um, a more open source version of the Phantoms and the Inspires? Pretty close, yeah. Um, the Phantoms and the Inspires are usually a generation ahead. Um, they have they have things like active tracking, and um, they have uh, forward-facing camera, multiple optical flow sensors. Um, but yeah, it's pretty close. Cool. Thank you.